Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding is made possible by grants from AM Trust Title, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Colliers International, NYC, Cohen Equities, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Camp Lejeune, Long Island, Bayside and then Plainview. Oh, I like tennis. I like soccer. I'm an athlete. What? Real estate? I know nothing about real estate. I'm going to be a physician. Nah, I'm going to change. I'm going to go to Wharton. I'm going to get a job, you know, uh, working for Laventhal as a consultant. Um, going to work for Related. Blackstone, Goldman Sachs. Nah, you know, there's an opportunity. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to build apartments. Uh, St. Martin, Florida, Vegas. Nah, there's an opportunity in the city. A company called Silverstein. I have the CEO of Silverstein Properties, Marty Berger. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me about your family. Tell me about your father's side and your mother's side. Sure, so my father's uh, relatives and my mother's relatives all came from the uh, uh, outskirts of Kiev in the Ukraine. Um, my grandmother on my father's side was actually born in the Ukraine and came over when she was two. She lived to be 104. Uh, she passed away three or four years ago. And uh, uh, my father's father um, was born here um, and uh, died at an early age uh, when my father was uh, in dental school, actually. Um, and my mother's parents were born here as well. Their parents were from Kiev. And uh, my grandmother on my mother's side lived till about 92. So I have pretty right, good genes. We have genes. the picture of her, right? Yes. So I have pretty good genes. And my grandfather uh, passed away when he was 60, I think. Now, your, your grandfather, you said to me, um, he was an entrepreneur. He, he had building in his blood, correct? He was an engineer and a builder. He uh, introduced the split-level home to Long Island, built a lot of what is today uh, Limbrook, Cedarhurst, uh, and uh, American Oceanside, uh, and Far Rockaway. And tell me about your father's father. My father's father was a scientist. Um, and Wrote a book? Wrote a book on how, uh, how to set a cast for your hip, because back then it was very difficult to set your hip. Um, I forgot the poly, polysaccharides or something like that was the name of the book. Um, but yeah, he was a scientist and my, and my grandmother was a nurse. Now, your father uh, grew up in Brooklyn, 
went to Midwood High School, and then uh, went to uh, dental school and directly from college, correct? Correct. So he started at Michigan State and then Brooklyn College, never got his college degree, went right to dental school, NYU Dental School, um, and then practiced as a dentist for you know, most of his career. And mom? My mother was a teacher early on and then was, uh, was uh, home for us. So how'd mom and dad meet? When my father's father passed away, he went down to Florida to blow off steam and actually um, fell on top of my mother's friend on a bus. And they met up that night and the rest is history. Okay, so your father uh, enlists in the Marines and he's in Camp Lejeune, which is Paris Island, I believe, uh, Jackson? Jacksonville, North Carolina. North Carolina, and you were born over there. Then your father's finished the time, he comes back here, and where do your parents live initially? We moved to Bayside, Queens, and then eventually out east on Long Island to Plainview. Right, where your father had his practice. Correct. So we lived in a, in a home that had the practice attached to it. The home office, as we would say. Home office. It was, it was tied into that. So then you moved to Huntington, right? Correct. Right, At, just before I started first grade. Okay, so talk to me about growing up. So we're always very sports-oriented. We grew up in a neighborhood with lots and lots of kids. Uh, I went to a very diverse high school with 735 kids per class. Uh, it was Walt Women High School in South Huntington. And our life revolved around baseball and basketball and soccer and deck hockey and whatever, football, whatever we could play every, every day after school. It was, it was something sports-related. Now, when you were in high school, um, you had no idea about uh, the real estate world? I had no idea anything about real estate. Didn't know what I wanted to do. So what happened? So when I graduated, I... I uh, graduated like seventh in your class, if I remember. It was seventh out of 735, so I did okay. Um, I did well on my SATs, and I ended up going to University of Pennsylvania. The um, liberal arts school at this time. I was enrolled in the College of Arts and Sciences, correct. And uh, I took a diverse array of classes my freshman year. And uh, from Economics 101 to Chemistry 101. And after my father reminded me that I couldn't stand the sight of blood, I decided not to be pre-med. And uh, I took more of the finance classes and ended up transferring into Wharton after my freshman year. But you still didn't know anything about real estate. You just went to Wharton. That's correct. So how does, how does this, uh, the kid who grew up in Long Island, have the opportunity to buy this building from a slumlord in Philadelphia in Delancey Street? <laughs> so uh, my, my, after my junior year of high school, I went to Cornell Summer School and I met a, a friend there. And we agreed that if we both got into Penn, we would room together, and we did. Turned out that his brother-in-law was, was the slumlord of West Philadelphia. Um, and when we got the lease uh, to, to live in one of his places sophomore year, it was so atrocious, my father said, go out and find a house. So we bought a house. Uh, actually, I bought a house with another friend. Uh, my father co-signed for the loan, and it was on Delancey Street, just in front of the vet school, just off campus. And I fixed it up over the summer into a six-bedroom house on four different levels, and uh, basically played landlord to my friends for... Uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year. So you were really doing a we live? <laughs> sort of a we live. Oh. And uh, it was an interesting uh, time living with my friends and also being a landlord. But uh, it was my first real estate deal. We bought it for, you know, not a lot of money, put some money into it and sold it for more than we bought, for, bought it for. And I didn't pay rent for three years. Your first year, you, you were either in camp or you were ta doing tennis lessons, I think. I taught tennis uh, after my freshman year. And, and the second uh, year, you learned about the junk bond business. I worked for Laventhal, not Laventhal, I worked for Drexel, for Drexel Burnham Lambert uh, in their order room, um, helping the, uh, the brokers, the successful brokers, uh, you know, transfer their orders down to the, to the floors of the exchange so the trades could get executed. And you realized that wasn't the... Uh, that was not for me. So the third year, you... Uh, Ended up at a law firm, correct? So my uncle had a law firm called Cooperman, Levin, and Winnikoff, and I was a summer uh, intern for him for the summer, which uh, basically odd ends and reading documents and helping out where I could. Good experience. Good experience. Then the LSATs happened. Took the LSATs, didn't, uh, didn't do particularly well, decided that the law wasn't for me. So you graduated in uh, May of 
87. Correct. With a degree in accounting. Finance and accounting. Finance and major. accounting, right. So how do you end up at the, the notable firm of Laventhal and Haworth? So back in 86 and 87 at, at Penn, they, they had one real estate finance class. And the undergraduate class was taught by Professor Joe Giorco, who's currently running the real estate department at Penn, the Zell Lurie Real Estate Center. Uh, and the graduate class was taught by a guy named Scott Erdang. And Scott happened to have been a partner at Laventhal and Horath in the Philadelphia office. And he said, uh, you should come to the New York office. We have a great hotel practice, but we have another group that's doing everything but hotels. And there's really only one person doing that right now, and you should fill that slot. And so I went up there and I um, worked alongside the, all the hotelies that went to Cornell. Uh, and I did everything but hotels, and it was uh, interesting. But you didn't practice accounting. You were more Never on, practiced the, accounting. Was on the consulting side. Correct. That's and right. one of these projects was a farm yeah. in Queens? It, well, it was, uh, it was a, a dairy uh, farm operation called Queensboro Farms. We had to do a, the highest and best use analysis for uh, some of their properties. And another project was a, a shopping center in Regal Park owned by... We're not sure if it was Donald or if it was father. No, it was Donald. It was one of uh, my first clients uh, through Laventhal was uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it was the Rego Park, uh, Queens, uh, I think it was called the, the Rego Park Center. And we had to do a repositioning analysis for his uh, shopping center there. So you were with Laventhal for a couple of years, and what happens? Go west, young man. I was there for a year and a half, and I, I realized that I didn't love being a consultant because my clients didn't listen to me. Uh, not that I knew so much, but uh, you know, um, I didn't like being in that position. And I found uh, a headhunter who helped me, uh, helped place me at a firm called the Related Companies. Back in 1989, March of 89, I was the first analyst in their development group. Uh, and I was really hired. How big was the related group at this time? Very small, probably 100 people. We were on one floor of 625 Madison on the ninth floor. All the divisions the, back then, the related companies were the development firm, the management firm, and the financial services firm and uh, called Related Capital. And uh, so I started there as a young analyst uh, on the Computer Associates World Headquarters development out in Long Island. And from there? Uh, became a uh, project manager under a guy named David Wine on the Monterey, which is a large 80-20 uh, project on the Upper East Side. Which was an interesting th situation because at that time, the dividing line, as one would say, was 96th Street. That's correct. And there was not a new development. I mean, Windsor Park came later. And uh, it was a groundbreaking uh, project. Because it was on the north side of 96th Street. And, uh, and it was a time when uh, there was sort of, there was a recession, and we really were the only building above 12 stories that was built in New York City uh, that finished in 1992. But it was a great experience for you. Fantastic experience. I did everything from run the numbers to buy the gym equipment for the, for the fitness center. So what happens after that? Um, so then the RTC days rolled in, and we bought some uh, multifamily properties with Apollo, Apollo's first couple of deals. Right, Tribeca Towers. Tribeca and, Tower we bought also with Apollo. Um, and uh, I, we weren't doing much development because there was no construction lending at that point in time after we finished the Monterey. And I got an unsolicited offer to go to Morgan Stanley, and I went and interviewed with them. Um, and they offered me a position where I would work half on their fund side and half on their advisory side, and I didn't want to be a consultant again. Uh, so I called a friend at Goldman Sachs and said, what do you think I should do? And they said, well, we can't poach you because you, you're a client, but if you're going to leave anyway, come work at Whitehall and do 100% acquisition. Which was the funds. Which was the, the acquisition, real estate acquisition fund for Goldman Sachs. So I started uh, the end of uh, 1993 at uh, Goldman Sachs, they had their best year ever. I got paid so much money. It was wonderful. Uh, and then 1994, they had their worst year ever. Uh, and every group had to let someone go. And, and last uh, in, first out. Last in, first out. So I was uh, politely asked to, uh, to find another job at the end of uh, 1994. Um, I had about 12 job offers in two weeks and I ended up at the Blackstone Group, um, where they were still finishing out their first fund and about to raise fund two. Um, so I started as a vice president at the Blackstone Group in uh, the November of 94. And how long did you stay at Blackstone before 
you get the phone call again from the related companies. So I was at Blackstone for two and a half years, really enjoying it. It was a fantastic experience, tr tremendous company, great people. Um, I was invested in 42 different properties at the time. And uh, uh, my only frustration there was I was a developer at heart and development had come back. And I brought three development deals under, uh, under the leadership of John Kukrell to, um, to the uh, investment committee and they really didn't want to do development which I understood, uh, and I had gotten a call from Steve Ross asking me to think about coming back to re the related companies, and he introduced me to a guy that he was partnering with named Ken Himmel, who uh, I think is one of the best mixed-use developers in, in the world. And I got, spent about six months getting to know Ken and listening to the opportunity, and I, I left Blackstone in uh, May of 1997 to rejoin the related companies and uh, helped run the mixed-use development group there, which is now called Related Urban Development. And some of the developments, one of them was this new property on Columbus Circle that a lot of people had planned on and off for many years. Time Warner Center, the old New York Coliseum site. Uh, I spent about six years of my life on that deal. Uh, many, many people contributed to that project. I sort of played the, the lead deal guy role. Um, where I helped put together a lot of the financing. I was the liaison between our equity partners, uh, Apollo and Mandarin Oriental Hotels and Time Warner uh, on the business side of things. And, uh, but we had teams of people working on the construction, on the design, on uh, putting everything together. But it was a really a monster project with eight different uses and, and four different owners and very complicated. Right, and also, and also besides that, it was a monster project because the residential units opened up right after 9-11. That's correct. So we were under construction during 9-11. In fact, we closed on the largest construction loan ever done in the United States at the time. It was $1.42 billion with GMAC. And just coincidentally, the same week, this was August 1st of uh, 2001, uh, Larry Silverstein purchased the World Trade Center with the same lender, GMAC, for I think a billion two fifty or a billion three. And uh, six weeks later, 9-11 occurred. And so everything stopped at our construction site and everyone was focused on downtown. Um, it was not a, not a fun time. So what happens, uh, you're related with Ken and the Urban Fund. Time Warner opened, uh, the hotel opened in 2003 and right. the rest of the project opened in February 2004. 2004. Uh, and uh, prior to that, we did a very large mixed use project in West Palm Beach called City Place that opened in 2001. Uh, we did another one in Birmingham, Michigan, called the Palladium at Birmingham. So we did a number of these, not as large as Time Warner Center, obviously. Um, and then I started working on some other projects. I opened related uh, Washington, D.C. office in the, in the middle of 2003. And then I opened up uh, related Las Vegas office in 2004, uh, where we built uh, a 5 million square foot uh, furniture showroom uh, project called right. the World Market Center. We have a picture of that right there. And then... Didn't Related also have other projects in Vegas? Well, we started a f company called Related Las Vegas, uh, where I was the uh, president, George Perez, from our Miami office, uh, who runs Related Florida, was uh, the CEO, and Stephen was chairman. And we got involved in four different projects there. Uh, and then when the market turned, uh, we decided to sell the land, and we got out by 2005, 2006 on all that stuff before, well before the crash. Mm. So what happens now? So I came back to New York after uh, successfully selling all this land, and we you know, made a bunch of money just being lucky on the timing. Um, better to be lucky than smart, right? So uh, I said to Steve Ross, what should we do now? And um, we didn't really come up with a great answer, so I said, I, I think I want to start my own company. And Steve was very gracious and let me keep space at Time Warner Center. And uh, I started a company called Artisan Real Estate Ventures. The street I grew up on in, in the Huntington was called Artisan Avenue. And um, I had sort of written a thesis on buying multifamily properties out in Las Vegas because there were about 8,000 people a month coming to Las Vegas, and they weren't creating 8,000 homes. Were these high-rise or were these? Uh... Uh, the the pr properties I bought were uh, garden-style apartments, two and three levels. And we bought uh, six projects in uh, about, containing about 2,000 apartments. You bought those with Square Mile? I bought those with Square Mile as my equity partner, yes. So what's happening now? So I uh, worked to manage those properties. I was also working uh, in the Caribbean trying to develop a project in St. Martin. And uh, I became the head of development of a resort project in Anguilla called Altamir. Um, 
And as you know, in 2007, 2008, things got a little frothy. The market changed. Uh, I got bought out of the uh, Anguilla project. I sold the, uh, uh, the St. Martin project at a loss. And then I um, focused on Las Vegas. So I spent a lot of time uh, in Las Vegas building different businesses. So it's what, 2009, you get a phone call from a recruiter? So 2009, I get a call from a recruiter who I'd used to help hire my company, uh, the folks at my company. And she said, we're uh, trying to work through a search for Larry Silverstein's successor. Can you help think through this with us? And it took me about 15 minutes to realize that she was asking me to come back to New York to meet with Larry. So I had the privilege of meeting Larry in May of 2009, uh, along with his, uh, his friend and, and now vice chairman of the firm. Back then, it was, he was the chief operating officer of the firm, Mickey Cooperman. I spent uh, about three and a half hours with each of the two of them. And had you ever met Larry before? I had met Larry once before when I was at Blackstone. Uh, he had, had come to us looking for equity on his River Place project, which he built. Um, I thought he was crazy because it was 921 apartments and he had been to all the New York families and everyone told him the same thing, it's too big. And he proved all of us wrong because <laughs> he built it and leased it up and it's, today it's still 98% leased. Um, so I met him in, 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 uh, in 1995. Um, I don't think he remembers meeting me though. Um, but you know, we had a nice conversation back in 2000, 2009 it was a really great month for me because I also met my, my wife on that, in that month. And you met her on J-Date. I met her on J-Date. So Alice hey, had I you met. ever done J-Date before or was this? I had just signed up for it on a Monday and three hours later I got a, a, a notification. A poke. A poke, whatever, whatever it is. Whatever it is. And uh, we went out that Friday and we've been together ever since. So we've been married four and a half years now. So it was a good week. It was a great week. So you meet Larry. <laughs> How long does it take before? Uh, so I met something? Larry and I met uh, Mickey and I came back every other Friday to, to sit with Mickey and thinking about how we would Were work you in Vegas thing. at this time? Or? I was going back between New York and Las Vegas. And <clears throat> they said, look, we, we found 12 people, seven people we interviewed, and you sort of tick all the boxes. You know, you've done. But you're too young. But I'm too young. You've done residential, you've done office, you've done development, you've done acquisitions. Um, and, and so we, we made a, a deal, but they said, we really don't want you to start as CEO. We want you to start as, as an EVP, and we'll see how you like it after two years, and we'll see how we like working with you after two years. And I said, you're going to pay me the same? And they said, sure. I said, are my responsibilities the same? They said, yes. I said, I don't care. It just works for me. So we did that for two years. And at the end of the two years, Larry came to me and said, it's worked out a lot better than we thought. I hope you like it here because uh, we want you to stay. And uh, I only have one problem. He says, I said, what's that? He said, I'm not ready to retire. I said, good, because I don't want you to retire. If Larry Silverstein's in the office, I can get an uh, interview with anyone. I can get a meeting with anybody. And so we agreed to be co-CEOs for the next two years, which we did. And uh, at the end of so 10, 11, 12, 13, the end of 2013, I became the sole CEO, and Larry became the chairman of the firm. So let's talk about what Silverstein has done since 9-11-2001. Uh, well, obviously, rebuilding the World Trade Center. Um, what's pretty astounding is that uh, after September 11th of 2001, by May of 2002, not that long after, we were under construction with seven World Trade Center. And the reason we were able to do that is because no one died on that site. Uh, that site basically melted from the ground up because it had all the Con Ed vaults in the, in the base, but it took a while to come down so everyone got out of the building safely. So there was no hallowed ground there. We didn't have to deal with any victims' families on that site. And Con Ed needed that site rebuilt because they had to house their, their generators there. So uh, we quickly designed uh, an incredible building which became the first LEED certified office building in New York City and uh, something we're very proud of today. Uh, we threw the code book out and just did things that were never done in buildings before. Um, so uh, that building actually was completed in four years and opened in May of 2006. So the first building to reopen at the World Trade Center area was that building. And then the 16 acre site uh, was master planned. It was a big master planning competition, if you recall. That was very controversial and uh, ended up that Daniel Liebeskin's plan of this cascading skyline and the Memorial Park, 8-acre Memorial Park, uh, won out 
and that was what we started executing on. Again, I wasn't there at the time, uh, but some of my colleagues that I worked with at the related companies on Time Warner Center had come over. So David Worsley, who runs our construction, came over, you know, 14 years ago. Uh, John Knipe, who was our, who was uh, the, my part of my legal team on on Time Warner Center, is the general counsel at uh, at Silverstein. And uh, Larry and Mickey went about redesigning the new World Trade Center, uh, which eventually, you know, is getting built. So today we stand with seven built, four built, three is opening uh, in April. And uh, the Port Authority uh, ended up taking back one World Trade Center and building one World Trade Center. Uh, so everything is built except for a performing arts center, which is going up now and should be completed by 2020. Uh, and, uh, and then the remaining building will be two World Trade Center, which will be a 2.8 million square foot building, about $4 billion. Let's talk about uh, the Four Seasons. Uh, one of the projects that uh, Larry had worked on, again, prior to me getting there was um, a site that he purchased with Calsters. When he opened Seven World Trade Center back in 2006, uh, Silverstein was the only tenant. And the next tenant to come along was Moody's. Uh, and Moody's moved in with 750,000 square feet, so they're really the anchor tenant for Seven World Trade Center. And they had their old building at 99 Church Street, about a block and a half away. And uh, Silverstein Properties and Calsters bought that old building, uh, took it down to the foundations, uh, and then designed a 926-foot tall tower with Robert Stern uh, that is magnificent, that was hotel at the base and condos at the top. And Larry situated my office so that I looked at that site every day. <laughs> Because there was no no one in the world that was going to finance that when you know I started at Silverstein in 2009, we were still sort of in the midst of this recession, and um, we uh, eventually um, got it financed, but not until 2013. <clears throat> in the meantime, the Four Seasons had come to us and said, "Hey, we have a project in Orlando, and we're buying the land, and uh, it's inside the park in Disney World." And Larry said. Um, we'll take the risk of getting the approvals and doing all the design work if you leave your money in the deal. And it was a substantial sum that Four Seasons usually don't, doesn't have that much money in any one deal. So they left their money in the deal. We spec'd our time and got all the uh, approvals done and did all the planning. Um, and then it was our responsibility to go out and find both the debt and the equity. Uh, so Dune Real Estate Partners is our equity partner in that deal along with Four Seasons. And uh, Carlos Slim's bank, Banco and Bursa, ended up being our construction lender. And we built that building, started in 2011, and opened it in the summer of uh, 2014. Today, is, it is the, the rate leader in Central Florida, I think by over $200 a night. It's an incredible property. The largest Four Seasons resort in the world is 445 Keys. Mm. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful property. So let's talk about family. Your wife's name? My wife's name is Allison. Tell me about children. I have a 22-year-old son and a 20-year-old son with my first wife. Um, Jason uh, went to Cornell, uh, 22, graduated this past June, works for Highgate Holdings, uh, Mahmoud Kimji's firm. Um, my younger son, Evan, is 20. He's also at Cornell, but he's an engineer. He's a uh, mechanical engineer with a business minor. And then I have a 14-year-old stepson, Jordan, uh, who just started as a freshman at Columbia Prep. So... It's really good that, as your father reminded you, you didn't like the sight of blood. Right. Because you've, you've really found a, a likening. You've been very involved in the community, numerous charities, you know, from the gift of giving to, uh, to ULI, to Wharton, and so on. And thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.